All right, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm more than excited to be back on a current stage this year. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this talk of mine. I want to talk about four uh, selected patterns which uh, have proven to be quite useful uh, to me in the past whenever I was working and operating in the context of uh, event-driven systems. A few brief words about myself. My name is Hans-Peter Grasl. I work as a developer advocate for Red Hat for about a year now. I am based in Graz, Austria, which is an, a geographic hint and an alternate way of saying I'm still heavily suffering from chat lag. Um, I try to be an open source uh, community uh, member, an active open source community member next to my day job and next to having family and kids. I'm quite fortunate and, and thankful that some of the stuff I was doing mostly at the intersection of the Apache, Kafka and MongoDB communities re received also some, some community recognition. Um, you, you can find me on Twitter. I think it's also the easiest way to, to stay in touch and stay connected um, after that in-person event. So if you want to uh, do that, feel free to follow me there and, and, and have some discussion anytime. Uh, enough about me. Let's take a quick look at today's agenda. Uh, we are mainly focusing on the following four patterns here. We start uh, to learn about the claim check pattern. We will then continue with the content enricher pattern. I will then uh, switch uh, to the message translator pattern and finally explain uh, the outbox pattern. The idea is that for each of these four patterns, I am basically using the same structure. I will first try to frame the challenge and how the pattern in question is uh, helping us to address certain challenges in that uh, regard. Uh, then we are going to discuss a basic hypothetical use case, how we could apply those patterns. And, and finally, the idea is that I show you a, a, a quick demo scenario even for each of those four uh, so that we understand how we can implement those patterns with a specific set of technologies in the context of Apache Kafka. Um, before starting with the first pattern, just let's take a little step back uh, and uh, because it's important to clarify some terminology. Whenever people talk about event-driven architectures, the question is what do they really mean when saying that? And, and on a very high level, this is quite simple to describe. Uh, it all comes down to designing loosely coupled applications or services and those applications and services uh, tend to communicate with each other based on the sending and receiving of events. The decoupling itself is what we achieve typically by uh, putting some intermediary in between uh, the communication flows, meaning some messaging infrastructure or some uh, event streaming platform such as Kafka. To make that a bit more concrete, there is a really good article and also a, a pretty good talk by industry giant Martin Fowler. Some of you may know that talk. And in this talk, he basically distills four different flavors of uh, event-driven systems. He talks about event notification. He talks about uh, event carried state transfer. He also explains the ideas behind event sourcing. And finally, he mentions CQRS, the letter which is usually combined with one of the other three uh, above. When I say event-driven in the context of my talk, and also uh, this is what we are going to see later, uh, I mostly refer to the first two types. So we are going to see basically a mixture, some kind of hybrid between event notification and event carried state transfer mostly. Irrespective of the actual flavor of EDA that we are, we are dealing with, uh, there is one vital aspect they all have in common, one thing to rule them all. Uh, and yes, you probably guessed that correctly, this is events. <laughs> events are ubiquitous. Uh, without them, there would be no such architectural style uh, in the first place. Now, there is tons of good material out there giving good guidance and recommendations about the do's and don'ts, how to design different event types, um, how to structure payloads, um, why schemas are extremely vital to, to use and attach to your uh, event payload so that you can validate those, and also uh, why, um, in the end, um, it's, it's important to understand that the different ways that you use to communicate those events uh, across your systems. My talk is not going to cover any of that. Um, and um, uh, instead, I try to uh, highlight one crucial aspect here. Uh, and that is that no matter how hard we try, no matter how uh, far we bend and stretch ourselves, we will essentially never be able to come up 
with something that could qualify as the perfect event payload. Even if we could fulfill uh, all the requirements of any downstream application with the events that we designed today, we, we might not be able to address the potential different needs of uh, the consumer apps that might pop up tomorrow. So even if we are uh, tempted to seek bullets of silver in how to design events, how to communicate those events, uh, at the end of the day, all we're going to find is trade-offs. And this, in fact, brings me exactly to the, to the four patterns of today, because those patterns, they help us to deal with certain implications of the, uh, um, for the way that we design uh, our event payloads, and also uh, the, the, the last one then being uh, a, a way how to uh, communicate uh, those in a reliable way in certain uh, scenarios. So let's get this started with pattern number one, the claim check pattern. So the challenge we are facing at one point is that we have to deal with unnaturally large, or as it's also written here, unreasonably uh, heavy event payloads. And that can have various different uh, reasons why that is the case. There is just two uh, mentioned here on the slides. One is maybe you are dealing with inherently binary data. We could summarize the examples on that slide with uh, dealing with media files somehow that we might want to communicate in an event-driven way. The other, uh, probably even more common scenario, is that you have, for the most part, some textual kind of payload, say JSON. Um, but some elements uh, in that, or some fields in that JSON payload, uh, they contain embedded data, embedded binary data that could be Base64 encoded. And at one point, uh, this all could just become too large to be reasonably handled with your uh, messaging infra or event uh, streaming platform. And the question is, what do you do then? Um, and the, what the claim check pattern suggests is that you try to find a way to externalize large payloads, or at least parts of those large payloads, to some other storage system. So it's about offloading binary payloads to separate storage. An example could be S3 um, that you use uh, in order to uh, store the actual data. And then you use uh, the S3 URL as the claim check. You replace the original payload. You just take that uh, claim check into the payload. And then you communicate that as your event. So on the downstream side of things, whenever some consumer wants to really work on the actual data, you would need to resolve that claim check, basically trade that claim check for the actual data against your uh, separate storage system that is uh, isolated from your messaging or event streaming infra. So the way this could work here in a, a pretty, uh, again, hypothetical scenario, all those scenarios are explained now within the context of Kafka, Kafka but you can imagine that you can use uh, any different technology stack for, for implementing those patterns that I'm showing here. So the first is a, a hypothetical kind of media processing pipeline, which uh, the idea is, again, to communicate images somehow in an event-driven way. And now the claim check pattern suggests that we, instead of sending image data to Kafka and trying to squeeze and tweak and tune it for handling large messages, we take the payload, we store the image elsewhere. In my case, it will be Minio, because uh, it's easier to, to, to run that in a self-hosted way. And then you use that claim check, you put that into your Kafka records value, and you send it along uh, into a topic. Uh, on the consumption side of things, the consumer that wants to do some image processing, maybe you want to detect something in that image, you want to, I don't know, I identify faces or whatever it is that you want to do with that image data, you will then need that claim check, and you would call out to the storage system S3 uh, to um, load the actual data, and then you could do your processing. So let's uh, take a look at how this example that I just described can, can, can work uh, in practice. And for that, I'm going to take my uh, sample repository here, and I, we are going to deploy a bunch of Kubernetes resources, right? So fingers crossed that all those demos are working. We are going to deploy a bunch of YAML manifests, and I am deploying against um, the OpenShift developer sandbox here. There is no more. Screen, yeah, it comes back. That's at least the good side of things. So let me go to my, to my um, web console in OpenShift. Um, and what we see here, we, we see the infrastructure elements on the right, right? We have Kafka here. We have Minio here uh, for doing the externalization. 
And then we have uh, our, in this case, an application that just randomly draws uh, from predefined images and wants to send those images to a topic. The way this works here is it will use a special serializer. That serializer will offload the actual image data to MinIO. Um, and whenever the consumer um, tries to work with that data, uh, it will do the reverse thing. It will load the Kafka record. It will realize, hey, the value contains a storage identifier, and it will load the actual image from the Kafka topic. So let's see the logs to see if something is going on here. So we see that here um, pictures are randomly sent, uh, and, and the payloads are externalized against S3. Um, let's quickly verify that here. Um, let me, for that purpose, uh, go to the topology view again, and let's open up min.io so that we can verify if something is actually stored there or not. So this brings up min.io. Um, and I, once the console is up, I can log in. Min.io want to very secret password, right? Obviously, I mistyped. Let me see. Yeah. And here we have our bucket. And here in that bucket, we have that externalized images. You see a few hundred kilobytes. Maybe some are more than a megabyte. Let's just verify that. Let's take any of these, download it, and see if we actually have a picture. Hopefully, nobody feels offended by a picture that is coming up now. I have no idea what it is. But yeah, that's it. So that's real images that we externalized here. And again, the way this works here is it uses a special serializer. It's a standard Kafka producer app written in Java. Special serializer that is open source called a uh, large uh, message serializer, open source by a company called Bugdata. And it uh, takes the responsibility of doing that payload externalization against the storage system. The consumer then will, if we verify the logs, it will retrieve the Kafka record. It will load the image data and execute some business logic. We don't have real business logic here. So what it does is extracts the size and it extracts some metadata like the width and height of the image. But you get the idea you could do some actual processing based on that data. For some reason, the, whenever I go here, the screen is turning black. But I try to avoid uh, uh, moving my foot uh, into that. So uh, here we are. Uh, and what the question is, what does a normal consumer that is not aware of those things see? And here, I, to, to illustrate that, I have just a normal console consumer. And that console consumer then um, shows quite nicely that a normal consumer just sees uh, Kafka record keys and the values, and the values being those S3 storage URLs for the actual uh, image that has been externalized. That's uh, the whole idea basically behind a simple application of that claim check pattern in the context of Kafka using a special uh, serializer in that case. With that, let me go back to the slides. Or in fact, first I'm going to uh, destroy that infrastructure so that we have a clean namespace for the next one that's coming up. Um, and so with that, we can go back to the slides. And we, we can start to look into the second pattern already. So the second pattern, once it comes up, it thinks about it, is the content enricher pattern. And here, we, as a challenge, we face pretty much the opposite of what we just discussed. We have sometimes uh, the problem that the events do not contain enough data for specific consumers that we have. This means we have unnaturally light, unnaturally uh, or unreasonably small payloads. Payloads are lacking additional details. We, most of the time, are missing some contextual information. Uh, and for certain consumers, that might be fine as is. For others, they want to have more information. Think about a very compact notification event that you communicate. And in its most puristic form, a, a notification event contains nothing but a domain entity's identifier. And then what would you do with that without loading actual data for that identifier from somewhere? And instead of you know, uh, moving that burden to, to a consumer, uh, we could do that upfront and enrich that message so that the consumer that wants to have that contextual information in addition to the uh, other stuff that's already in the payload, we can use uh, the idea of content enrichment. So with that, we can basically increase the utility of sparse event payloads uh, for certain types of uh, 
consumer applications. We're going to miss, uh, uh, we're going to add missing data like contextual information. I said that, and very often what this means in a streaming uh, context is that we need to find a way to do lookups against the identifiers or perform join operations um, in a, a stream processing app. We're going to then take the uh, reference data that we were looking up or joining with, and we're going to augment uh, the original payload and create a new enriched event that can be consumed uh, from any downstream application. Again, here a hypothetical case, uh, context of sensor data processing. What we are doing here is we have some reference data. That reference data has meta information about different types of IoT devices that are in the field. They are stored in a relational database. Here it's MySQL. And then we're going to use, in this case, the concept of change data capture. We're going to use a fantastic open source project called Debezium for that purpose. It helps us to ingest this reference data for the devices into a separate Kafka topic. Does a snapshot once we start it, and then it continuously streams any changes that are happening to that reference data also into the Kafka topic. Then we have that raw sensor data stream. And that sensor data stream only contains a device identifier and the raw measurements. And now we have this problem that some consumers would want to have this additional uh, device metadata uh, next to uh, the raw sensor uh, measurement stream. And this is where, uh, again, the idea of this pattern comes into play that we can realize with a separate stream processing app that does this enrichment uh, b beforehand so that a consumer that wants to work with the full uh, view on, on, this, on, on the measurements plus the device data has everything uh, needed uh, in order to do uh, their job. It can be a Kafka Streams application. It can be some SQL abstractions. You could think about having a, a Flink job that does that enrichment or, or whatever it is that you use for uh, stream processing in that regard. Instead of an actual consumer, the consumer here is a sync connector that uh, just takes that enriched data, writes it into a MongoDB time series collection for doing some time series based analysis on the data. And it, we could then also incorporate the metadata of the devices. Let me um, show that example as well uh, in action. So let me go to the, to the namespace in my uh, Kubernetes environment here. Um, let me go to the correct folder. And then again, let's apply, let's apply the manifest for that example here. Um, and again, it, it spins up a bunch of, of, of things uh, in that cluster. And we are going to inspect that one by one, what's happening here. So here we have the first, I'm going to show you the reference data. So what we have in the MySQL database is basically those 10 uh, records that are in that table that describe our devices. So we have the ID, we have some active flag, we have some location where the device currently is in the field, and we have some uh, made up brand name here next to those devices. So this is the metadata in that example that we're going to use. And by now, let me check if the, if the example is up and running. I rearranged the UI a bit so that we can again better see what's going on here. Let me fit that to the screen. So again, on the left, we have the application side of things. On the right, we have the infrastructure components. We have again Kafka, we have Kafka Connect. We have our two databases, MySQL and MongoDB here. And again, this connect, uh, this connect instance will run a, a Debezium source connector for MySQL, uh, read that device data, bring it to a Kafka topic. We then have this uh, producer application that fakes random measurements for those 10 devices. So again, I will just open the logs here so that you see basically every second it's a bit hard to see. Every second, it produces a random uh, sensor measurement data here uh, for uh, those 10 different device IDs. And that's that raw stream that is missing any additional device data here. And then we have this uh, enricher application here, the uh, Kafka Streams app in this case. And again, you can swap it out for anything else that you want to use for streaming. Um, and that, uh, ta the task of that app is to take now, for every incoming raw sensor data measurement, it needs to create an enriched record. So basically, it's going to do that join over that device ID between the uh, enriched. And again, I'm trying to zoom in a little bit here um, to, against the device uh, metadata. Let's do it like that. And you can see it better. 
So for every incoming sensor data, we uh, create an enriched sensor data record and write it into a separate topic. And those enriched records have this additional information that comes originally from that database holding this uh, device information here. Um, let me, with that, just uh, verify then, because we have then another component, the sync connector, that will read from that Kafka, enriched Kafka topic and write the results uh, into a MongoDB time series collection. Let me just verify if that is actually working. So I'm going to the terminal right here. We're going to, to do it uh, old school here. We have no UI. We're going to do it on the shell. I'm going to use the Mongo shell here directly on the pod. <laughs> you only live once, right? Use IOD DB, um, DB get collection. Get, if I can type here, get, get DB get collection. Something like this, yeah. Sensors TS. Is it called, I guess, sensors TS? And then we're going to do a find one here. And we should see that enriched sensor data uh, coming to that. And again, let me expand that so you better see that. We see that enriched sensor data now, uh, despite the raw measurements and the ID, we have that uh, brand name. We have the geolocation of the device, all of that that originally came uh, from the database and was used in the enrichment step uh, for uh, for the raw sensor data stream. So that uh, concludes basically um, this uh, example that I wanted to show here for that pattern. With that, let me go back. Let me, again, as uh, previously, just um, tear down the whole scenario so, so that we have another clean namespace to, to, to move on. Delete all of that. It feels good to delete stuff from a cluster, right, even if it's just like for demos, but uh, ha having some, some fresh state again is, is always a good feeling. At least for me, that's, that's the case. So um, let me go back to the slides with that. Yeah, so that example basically uh, shows uh, hopefully how we can benefit. Again, it is, it's a simple use case. You can imagine uh, much more complex enrichments going on. You can imagine to combine that with more complex computation. So again, uh, there is uh, there's just uh, some kind of example that you understand how you could use that uh, pattern in a certain context. Let me come to the third pattern of the talk. And the third pattern is the message translator pattern. So with that pattern, what, that, what, what we try to solve is the challenge that we have very often the case that we need to deal with either just inconvenient event payloads, so they are probably have been uh, structured like that many years ago, and today uh, we would like to work with those uh, events in a, in, in, in a different way. Some consumers would expect the payload to look different. Another thing could even be that we have, it's not only inconvenient, but even incompatible uh, for certain consumers uh, uh, to work with uh, specific event payloads. So here are just two examples whenever we need to touch uh, legacy systems. This could be quite helpful. Or whenever we need to deal with uh, proprietary data formats, data formats that we do not want to uh, uh, keep spreading across our whole uh, uh, consumer landscape. Uh, so uh, instead of tying new consuming applications to a very aged uh, way of, of expressing data uh, in the events, we, we, we want to have some way to translate those events so that we can, I don't know, even use completely different uh, serialization formats or completely different uh, way to express our payloads. The way we do this is we try to establish that compatibility by between uh, originally disparate systems by just making payload modifications on the fly. So the message translator pattern here is used uh, to make compatible what originally was, wasn't. We can uh, perform essentially any payload modification that you uh, could think of. Uh, there are some simple ones. Maybe you just need to uh, do some basic data type conversions. Maybe you want to get rid of certain fields that you don't need. Maybe you want to 
uh, I don't know, mask or redact sensitive information. You could even encrypt specific fields if you want to. Uh, and we could switch the, the, the way that, that the whole event payload is serialized. So in our case, we are going to see that uh, we are working with an, a CSV file and, and, and bring it to, to some kind of JSON structure. It can also be used, uh, so the same idea um, uh, can be used to build uh, of what is called an anti-corruption layer in terms of domain-driven design. Um, so whenever you think about communicating data outside of a bounded context, it's usually a bad idea to try to do that in a one-to-one -one fashion because it would mean you would leak your internal domain model to the outside world. And this is very often not what you want to do or it's, in fact, in almost every case this is not what you want to have because it would again mean that your consumers would start to rely on that kind of contract and you would have a tough time to modify uh, the internal data model that would immediately be reflected to the outside world and so you use that idea of a message translator pattern to uh, to have that anti-corruption layer and to have a separate representation of your data um, to the outside world one example is uh, using change data capture. If you think about change data capture, you capture your database uh, and if you don't do anything, you basically expose the data model ex in, in exactly the same way that it is currently looking in your database and all your consumers will start to work with exactly that uh, data model. And if that data model changes, problems will start to arise. Uh, so here, whenever you do CDC and, 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 and want to serve many different consumers that are, are living in their own kind of uh, uh, bounded context, uh, ideally you transform that CDC payload in flight so that you don't suffer from that problem. Here uh, the example is as follows again related to Kafka like all four examples are uh, we try to uh, do that message translation in this case with Kafka connect only so uh, we can use uh, source connectors in order for instance here we have a hypothetical case of point of sales record data that is written into files that are stored in some storage uh, the details here don't matter in, in this uh, it could be any kind of storage uh, proprietary CSV files that you cannot uh, use as is in order to feed them into a, a target web service that expects a very specific payload structure on the other end. And so we're going to use uh, Kafka Connect here. We have file uh, source connectors. We can use those to read that CSV. All of those CSV records will be written from, from various different files that it finds in some storage location. And on the fly, we are going to apply certain uh, translations. So uh, they are called uh, transformations or single message transformations to be precise in the context of Kafka Connect. We can use those in order to make those payload uh, modifications that I was referring to. In addition, we can switch the uh, serialization format. So we can move from, uh, from a CSV structure to JSON. We can rename those fields in exactly the way that the uh, target web service is expecting those. And then what we ingest into the Kafka topic is a payload that is uh, already um, working as is for uh, the target application. In this case, the idea is that we post all of those uh, point of sales records against a, a web service. And uh, for that, again, we can use uh, as an HTTP sync connector that takes those JSON records. And in addition, what it allows us to do is we can buffer multiple of those together such that we don't send a post request for each and every single record. So you can think of uh, smaller batches, say up to 10 such uh, uh, point of sales records that the API can uh, process with one HTTP call. That's the idea behind that message translator pattern. Again, let me uh, show that uh, scenario to you in action um, so that we have some uh, things going on here that we can uh, investigate a bit uh, further. So first, what we're going to do is I'm going to bring up again, make sure that I'm in the proper folder, and then I'm going to bring that up real quick. And while it's coming up, I'm going to just again show you some some uh, stuff that we are working with here. So here we have some files, and this is, uh, this is 10,000 uh, such uh, point of sales record information in, in some CSV structure. We have some 
um, um, some column naming that, that will be used uh, then in, in our JSON payload uh, as field names, but we're going to rename those to have some, some, some better or different naming. Uh, we're going to throw away some of the fields that we don't need, and, and, and we're also going to parse those numeric strings uh, to real uh, uh, numeric data types, and also the Booleans will become uh, Boolean types and stuff uh, like that is going on for each uh, record that is processed from, from that file. Again, using Kafka Connect, this means we can do all of those uh, uh, modifications uh, with configuration only. There is no need for, 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 for any uh, custom code in that regard, uh, just in case you haven't uh, been exposed to Kafka Connect uh, before. I'm mentioning that. So here, the scenario is, is, is simpler. We have on the left-hand side the infrastructure components. We have Kafka and Kafka Connect again. We have then uh, this uh, application that represents the target service that we're going to feed those uh, uh, records into by means of HTTP post calls. And we have the connector that uh, processes those records. So here we just have a consumer that shows us how the resulting JSON records are looking like. So we have seen the, so here we are, we have seen the CSV structure and we see that we go from, I just take one of that out real quick. We can go from, from that CSV structure to something like this. Um, and, and this is that message translation uh, that is happening in this uh, simple scenario right there. And then uh, at the end, the idea is that that sync connector, and let me verify that uh, real quick uh, as well, the sync connector should then receive those um, as uh, batches of up to 10 records. And here we just see the console logs of that application. And, and indeed, we mostly get 10. Sometimes we get less. So it's at most 10 records that we are receiving. And again, instead of some actual processing on the data, we just like log it here for uh, the purposes to see the whole uh, data flow end to end. Yeah, that concludes uh, the message translator pattern. So we are moving to the fourth and final pattern already, and then maybe we are lucky and even have some time for, for questions. Let me see if I can manage to do that. Outbox pattern. Uh, the first three that, I'm showing, uh, that I was showing were mostly uh, referring to, let's say, challenges that we have with the event payloads uh, themselves. The final one is different. This pattern focuses more on the communication side of, of, of events. And the challenge that we very often have, uh, you would be surprised how often this is really happening. I see that um, over and over again in the wild, and it always gives me some, some goosebumps, uh, the, the negative ones. Um, because uh, what, uh, what the challenge that we face here is that we try to up consistently update two different uh, data systems, um, and we want to do that in a consistent way. And the problem is some people immediately think, oh, yeah, I will use something like distributed transactions, which if you have ever used them uh, yourself, you know they are coming with their own caveats. And irrespective of that, sometimes there is not even the option to use something like an XA transaction because the system, the both systems that you want to work with, uh, may not uh, support them uh, in the first place. So one uh, common example that we see in event-driven architectures are microservices that uh, write to their own database that is backing the microservice in question. And in addition, they want to communicate some facts about the stuff they have just done and persisted uh, over some messaging infrastructure. So meaning we want to add and what want to send events uh, to a Kafka topic. And if we do that with two separate writes, the problem is that we suffer from something called a dual write, and this will lead to inconsistencies. So the outbox pattern allows us to avoid that a dual write issue in the first place by focusing on just one of those resources. And in most cases, this is, of course, the database that you are working with that gives you uh, proper asset, um, asset transactions. And what you're going to do is uh, you are going uh, to start a database transaction. You are going to make your uh, data changes as usual. So you're going to change the domain data. But in addition, and in the same transactional context, you will update your uh, event information and you write that into a table that we call the outbox table here. So this means either both of those things are happening or none of them because it might be rolled back. And now the thing is that 
communicating those events that are landing in that outbox table um, from the same transactional scope is delegated to a separate process. And again, this in, in our case will be a separate CDC pipeline that listens on that outbox table and will uh, transfer all those uh, events from the outbox table into a, again, messaging infrastructure uh, and in our case, a Kafka topic. The way this looks like is as follows. We have a very simple order service here, uh, persisting data to MySQL. Uh, it, it has at least two tables that it, it touches for each of uh, the transactions, an order and order lines table. And in addition, it will write to the outbox table and communicate the fact that it, for instance, persisted a new order or uh, the, the fact that it needed to change an order line and things like that. So you are completely free, basically, how you would uh, design this outbox table. There are some recommendations and examples out there that you can uh, draw from uh, to build your own one. But the structure of that table is, is essentially up to you. Um, and once you have that, uh, you know that you can consistently write, in this case, all three tables with all the changes that are happening. And then you are going to use CDC. In my case, I will use, uh, in the example, the Debesium connector again, that will listen only on the outbox table uh, events and propagate those into Kafka topics. And then any uh, consumer uh, that is interested in order-related events that are generated now uh, in a consistent way in the database and then eventually consistently uh, uh, written to a Kafka topic, uh, you can have any downstream consumer work uh, on that data um, then afterwards. Again, let me bring up the example for that one. I forgot, I get, oh yeah, I forgot to delete that stuff. Let's do that quickly. Delete. Then let's go to the final one. And let's hope that it also deploys uh, properly here. So what we have, and I'm going to close what we don't need anymore. We have uh, the, I need to go back to that. Oh, I closed my, my cluster view, right? Developer sandbox. I mistakenly closed the tab, but bear with me. Should be up soon. Yeah, so let's see what we got here. Yeah, we have the infrastructure. Again, on the right, I will make that a bit smaller. And then we have our order service here. Uh, we have a process that automatically creates some orders. Two orders, to be precise, will be created. Uh, and then we're going to make some order line changes. And all of those things will result in multiple different events being written into that outbox table from, in, from within the same application, within the same transactional scope, they will land in uh, that Kafka topic. And then uh, we go into, uh, of course, have again uh, here Kafka Connect running, the Debesium uh, MySQL source connector here, uh, bringing those outbox table changes to Kafka. And then instead of a real consumer, we are going to see just a, a console consumer to, to see those uh, communicated change events uh, fly by on uh, in our logs here. So let me verify if the orders create a script did something. Yes, the order service was up and then it made some uh, uh, rest requests. So what it did basically is it generated, um, uh, let me show that to you, it generated um, this order with two order lines and another order with three order lines. This led to uh, order upserted events in the outbox table, which were communicated to a Kafka topic behind the scenes. And then it made order, change, order line changes. It basically changed uh, the, uh, all of those order lines to, uh, to have the status shipped. And uh, all of those order lines from the first one were uh, swapped to be uh, or changed to be canceled instead. And so again, these order line change events were uh, created behind the scenes. And this led to a bunch of, of, of events, uh, ideally, that we should see now when we inspect the, the Outbox consumer logs here. And indeed, let me just uh, open one of those change events. So this is a typical uh, change event payload that, as you would see it from uh, the Bezium, let me just bring one into the editor because it's easier uh, to, to see what's going on here. 
So this represents one of those change events. The actual payload data coming from this outbox table is this one. Uh, the rest is additional information that in this case the Debesium source connector provides us with. Um, we're going to see the structure that uh, here is uh, the most interesting part is in our case here the payload that represents a full order. So we see uh, that this is uh, uh, basically that the order as it has the order state uh, that we received uh, when the order was placed originally and after we would do orderline change events we should see updates also in this whole uh, purchase order uh, aggregate type uh, uh, and order with the proper order upserted event. So we're gonna have a way uh, when we do it that way that all of those events uh, are communicated in a reliable and consistent way. That concludes this fourth pattern. Let me come back to the slides real quick one more time and uh, wrap that up. So uh, to summarize that, I, I hope I was able to show you some of the challenges that you definitely face at one uh, point uh, in your uh, event-driven systems. And I hope that we have seen that uh, we will have the need uh, to apply some of those patterns in order to address some of those challenges that we uh, face when developing event-driven systems. We have discussed the claim check pattern that helped us to externalize large uh, payloads into separate storage systems. We have discussed the content and richer pattern for doing pretty much the opposite. We're going to bring in additional data and augment otherwise sparse uh, payload and thereby increase the utility of such sparse events on the consumption side. We have seen how the message translator pattern helps us to uh, make uh, or establish compatibility between otherwise incompatible and disparate systems. And finally, we, we saw one way to reliably uh, communicate um, changes that are written to a database and uh, need to be sent elsewhere uh, to some other downstream consumers over messaging infrastructure. So I hope that was useful. If you want to try out and uh, inspect those uh, simple examples uh, on your own, you find uh, a repository there. It contains everything you need. You can also run those examples only locally uh, with containers. So there is Docker Compose files as well for studying that a bit uh, closer. If you want to give it a look uh, afterwards, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, the idea is that over time, I will add more patterns to that, uh, to that repository. Uh, so now we have those four might be that I'm going to add multiple one, multiple, uh, a few more that, that are interesting in, uh, in, to, to have in, in, in the same repository. Just one note, uh, there is another talk by some of my colleagues tomorrow at 4.30, uh, again focusing on some parts that are interesting uh, to learn about. Uh, in this case, uh, it will feature Streamzy uh, showing how you can run uh, Kafka with operator uh, on top of Kubernetes, also showing again the idea of change data capture in a little bit more de uh, in depth. Uh, so they, they, pretty, pretty cool talk by two of my colleagues. There's also a raffle at the end. So if you want to check out that talk tomorrow by other Red Hatters, feel free to do that. And with that, I thank you for your time. And I see we have two and a half minutes for probably one or two quick questions. Otherwise, I'm happy to take your questions at the Red Hat booth. I'm there today and tomorrow, more or less all day. Uh, find me there. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for so much for listening. Uh, it was it was great to be here, and I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you.